Good evening and welcome to another presentation from the Agency for Public Information. This program is coming to you in the evening of Tuesday, July 26, 2016. Here are the stories we're following this evening. St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Republic of Ecuador sign a visa waiver agreement to facilitate the ease of travel between both countries. The Catholic-run Our Lady of Guadalupe Home for Abuse Girls receives a much-needed facelift. And the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, convenes an early hurricane warning simulation exercise. We'll speak to the instructors and participants on this evening's program. This informative package begins with Newswatch. Let us join Kisha Woodley at our news desk. Good evening and welcome to Newswatch. I am Keisha Woodley, President of the St. Vincent and the Grandins Bar Association and former Minister of Culture, the Honorable René Batiste, was re-elected as Speaker of the OECS House of Assembly. The election took place in Antigua and Barbuda last week, where OECS member states gathered for their first meeting since 2012. Former Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party Senator, now Ambassador to Mexico, Her Excellency Gail Christian, has been elected as Deputy Speaker. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment is advocating freedom of choice as it relates to whether a woman chooses to delay pregnancy due to the possible threat the Zika virus may pose to the unborn child. Minister of Health, Wellness and the Environment, Honorable Robert Luke Brown, in his remarks at a recent press conference, noted that with the possible threat of Zika, the ministry has put in place measures for the prevention of the transmission of the virus and psychological assistance will also be provided. The decision of childbearing is intensely personal and uh, individuals in their own deliberate judgment will come to a conclusion on whether or not in their circumstances it is a suitable thing for them to do. Uh, the ministry would, for its part, however, just provide guidance and counseling. Well, if, if in a case where, uh, or pre, before pregnancy, an individual who's considering pregnancy, in such a situation, we provide guidance generally speaking about some of the the possible risk that may come with respect to the Zika virus and other issues that might arise for individuals who and, and they and they make the options that they may be available to them including perhaps contraceptive options and so on and then we allow them to make a decision now if someone is already pregnant we take an additional step, at least a few additional steps. One is that we have medicated nets, which have been provided by, by PAHO, which we supply to the clinics, and I think we have a sufficient supply to almost cover most of the people who are pregnant in St. Vincent, so they have that possibility. There, there are some proposals in relation to mosquito repellent or kinds of issues that have been tabled for our consideration as well, but I don't think that we are yet in a position to conclude on those particular proposals. But, and we advise them to do regular screening as often as possible, and uh, that I think is, in a nutshell, uh, captures our policy in relation to advice and provisions for pregnant people at this time. The press conference was held at the Ministry of Health's conference room on Tuesday, 21st July 2016. Finally on Newswatch, the Caribbean Policy Development Center, CPDC, based in Barbados, recently spearheaded a workshop for youth in agriculture. The workshop was held at the Peace Memorial Hall on Tuesday, July 19. But the whole intention of the exercise is how do we move from 
problem to result. The final outcome would be a finalized youth and agriculture policy, which will assist the government to implement specific actions to address the challenges and to encourage ex the expansion of youth activities in agriculture. Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Saboto Caesar, sought to make recommendations to address issues facing youth in agriculture and the factors that constrain youth from becoming involved in agriculture. If we don't cross that very important hurdle that during the stage of our primary socialization, many of our parents and grandparents said to us, my father told me that. He said, I did not get the chance to get a secondary school education. I don't want you to come and work as hard as I am working. And we were taught in rural St. Vincent and the Grenadines that success in economics meant academics and not agriculture. These are all the stories that we have for this evening's edition of Newswatch. Thank you for joining us. I am Keisha Woodley. Protecting our marine environment Our forests, our wildlife, for our children Pollution of our rivers and beaches Deforestation and overfishing threaten to destroy our biodiversity Protected areas are set aside by law to protect these fragile ecosystems which provide us with water, food, electricity and recreation Tobago Keys Marine Park, Kingsill Forest Reserve and Milligan Key Wildlife Reserve are examples of our local protected areas Be inspired and help preserve what is naturally ours Let's Protected areas protect life. A message from the Environmental Management Department and the National Parks, Rivers and Beaches Authority. Thank you very much and welcome back to our program. Our first presentation this evening. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Republic of Ecuador signed a visa waiver agreement on Tuesday, July 19 at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Conference Room. The agreement will facilitate the ease of travel between both countries for business and pleasure. The agreement was signed by the non-resident Ambassador of the Republic of Ecuador to St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We have more in this report from the API's Ashishia Sam. St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Republic of Ecuador has moved one step closer towards the strengthening and deepening of bilateral relations with the signing of a visa waiver agreement on Tuesday, July 19th at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Conference Room. The agreement was signed by non-resident ambassador of the Republic of Ecuador to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, His Excellency Galio Yepes Oligin, and Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Honorable Sir Louis Straker. The visa waiver agreement will encourage the ease of travel between both countries for business and pleasure while strengthening the bilateral relations. Non-resident ambassador of the Republic of Ecuador to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, His Excellency Galio Yepes Oligin, said that St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Republic of Ecuador has established a common path towards the development of both countries. He noted that the signing of this visa waiver agreement will boost the tourism and business sectors of both countries. We are going to establish uh, an act to, uh, um, to give facilities for people to move and that is going to improve also tourism and also business and we are very happy of that and 
I please, Mr. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, say hello and thanks to Mr. Ralph Gonzalez. And also, I would like to thank you for your presence today here and for uh, receive me. I am very pleased to be here. His Excellency noted that the Republic of Ecuador and St. Vincent and the Grenadines have collaborated on a number of initiatives, which signals the growing friendship between both countries. We want also to thank the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines for the help we have had received after the, the earthquake we had three months ago. And we received a big quantity of money from St. Vincent's and the Grenadines. And that was a big cooperation we have had received. And also we have, have received the, the, the teaching of, of English for uh, the diplomats and, the, um, and also for the teachers from the, uh, also we have sent here a few teachers 44, not, not, not a few for you, but they learn English here and they are now uh, teaching English in the secondary schools in Ecuador. So we're very happy about these corporations. Uh, uh, we are not talking in the air, we are talking about facts. And, and that's what I like uh, to tell today, that uh, the relation is really improving. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Honorable Sir Louis Stricker noted that St. Vincent and the Grenadines has come a long way in deepening and strengthening its diplomatic relations with the Republic of Ecuador. Minister Stricker added that the signing of this visa waiver agreement will further cement the relations between both countries. The relationship, though started 27 years ago, was one that was not a very robust relationship. But ALBA, particularly, has brought us together and we, ha we are enjoying a solidarity and a friendship which we have not enjoyed, enjoyed in the past. It is very fascinating to look on the foreign policy of both Ecuador and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. At a time when many countries of the world are seeking to control their borders and to keep out people, and when those who are running for high offices in some country are talking about building walls to separate countries, here we are at little tiny dot, an island St. Vincent and the Grenadines, developing such a strong relationship with a much larger country through love and friendship between the governments and the peoples that we are willing to take the step to have a visa waiver agreement that our people can go to Ecuador and the Ecuadorians can come to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I think we are to teach Donald Trump and others who are talking about dividing countries, neighboring countries, a lesson as to how we can dwell together in unity in this region. The Foreign Affairs Minister outlined the expectations of this visa waiver agreement between St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Republic of Ecuador. We would like to sign this visa waiver agreement with the expectation that this is about the beginning of what we expect a greater flow of tourism between our two countries. With the coming on stream of the international airport at Argyle, we are dwelling in the same hemisphere and we are hoping that Ecuadorians can come here without a visa and can enjoy the hospitality and the warmth of our people here in St. Vincent. And we can do the same thing despite the language barrier 
we can do the same thing when we go to Ecuador. And that means that we have to give a little bit more impetus to our schools that they must teach Spanish in a more rigorous way. I'm hoping that with the globalized world we are living in, and in a hemisphere where Spanish is about the principal language, that many of our students would get involved in learning this language so that we can become more united together in this hemisphere and have a greater unity people to people. We trust that as we sign this agreement, it would go forth to, throughout the length and breadth of St. Vincent that we have a friend in Ecuador. You have demonstrated that already with your Army Corps of Engineers that have come here to build the bridges for us. You have built the physical bridges. We have the diplomatic bridges. And we hope that we can have the bridges person to person. We know that you have suffered a great earthquake earlier this year. And we ourselves are subjected to natural disasters. So we can commiserate and empathize with, our, with your people and our people because we understand the damages and the ravages of natu uh, na uh, natural disasters. But we trust that with the help of God, we would always be there for each other to encourage and uphold and support our peoples. And we hope that your presence here and the signing of this diplomatic, this visa waiver agreement would bring us even closer to together. And as we journey together, we would realize greater upliftment for our people and our countries as members of ALBA, members of the United Nations, members of the OAS, members of CELAC. We hope that this would cement our relationship. Straker noted that the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines has a very pragmatic and progressive foreign policy that aid in the development of the country and the upliftment of Vincentians. We want to maintain our traditional friendship, our friend, traditional friendship with those countries in Europe and in the United States and Canada that we have maintained over the years. But we have been seeking to bridge the gap and maintain very strong relationships with the countries of Africa, the countries of South and Central America, and the countries of Asia. We want to make sure that we can make a contribution, whether culturally or otherwise, and support them where they need support. And certainly, we need the support of these countries. Never in the history of this country have we had another a foreign country coming to our aid at the time of disaster. And within eight months, the Army Corps of Engineers could come here and build four bridges after the disaster we suffered on Christmas Eve 2013. And we are grateful for the Army Corps of Engineers, the government and people of Ecuador for coming to our aid and giving us such a tremendous boost, taking us from the disaster that we experienced and enabling us to have a connectivity again in our country. Ecuador has been reaching out not only to St. Vincent, but to CARICOM. But we have been slow in CARICOM in embracing the initiatives put forward by Ecuador. Ecuador would like a free trade agreement with CARICOM. And we have to make sure that in CARICOM we act on that. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have signed a number of memoranda of understanding or memorandum of understandings with Ecuador which enabled 
Ecuadorian teachers to come here for an intensive course in English. And some of them have been here at our community college. They have gone elsewhere in the Caribbean, in Dominica and at Cave Hill to learn English. And we are looking forward to having that program remain on stream and that they could come here more in greater numbers to enjoy our hospitality and to learn the English language. We hope also that the program providing English to those in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs coming into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in St. Vincent and our diplomats going to Ecuador, we can have a stronger exchange so that we can learn best practices in the ministry from your ministry and vice versa. We are hoping that these things would really strengthen the relationship. I know that our prime minister has gone to Ecuador and la uh, July 2014, he was well received and given the highest honor that Ecuador could give, which is the National Order of Merit to our Prime Minister. We appreciate such great honor and he was honored for his work in building solidarity between Latin America and the Caribbean. We've had visits here also from your foreign minister, Foreign Minister Patinio, who came here, I believe, twice. I don't know whether he's still the foreign minister. No, he's minister of defense now. All right, he's minister of defense now. But he has been here twice, visiting our country and seeking to cement the relationship and we appreciate all of that I have not gone to Ecuador as yet as Minister of Foreign Affairs but I look forward to going to Ecuador, Equ Ecuador sometime in the future we are hoping also that we can provide you with and help you to select an honorary council which you have been seeking for some time here in St. Vincent and we have been trying to get an honorary council in Ecuador. We have to work together to see how we can bring to fruition these initiatives. St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Republic of Ecuador established diplomatic relations on August 1st, 1989. The relationship has significantly deepened over the last five years as both countries have been working assiduously towards the creation of a closer bilateral relation. Ashisi Assam reporting for the Agency for Public Information. Real men protect children, not harm them. Under the Convention of the Rights of a Child, a child is anyone under the age of 18, and it's sexual abuse if you ask to see or touch their private parts, touch them inappropriately, show them or force them to touch your private parts, have sex with them, show them pornographic material, or deliberately let them hear or see the act of sex. Real men don't abuse children and they don't encourage others to do it either. Be a real man. For more information, please contact these agencies. This message brought to you by UNICEF and this station. Thank you for staying with us. Welcome back to our program. The Our Lady of Guadalupe home is located at Canaan in Mariaqua and is home to young abused girls. The Catholic-run home has the Ministry of Social Development as one of its benefactors. The home recently received some much-needed assistance from Digicel. Here's the story from the API's Kathy Rose. The 
Our Lady of Guadalupe Home houses 16 young ladies at the moment who have been exposed to abusive situations. The home was started by the late sister Patricia Ann Douglas, former principal of the St. Joseph's Convent Mariqua, and at present is being governed by a board of directors. Like any institution of this nature, it is challenging to maintain and expand the facility and services. Hence the reason to seek assistance from generous contributors. In this case, telecommunication giant Digicel came to the rescue of the home. On July 19, after spending approximately 150,000 Eastern Caribbean dollars to refurbish and assist with the sustainability of the home, Digicel unveiled the final product to members of the board, workers and other well-wishers of this important institution. Representing the home, Dr. Miriam Sheridan extended gratitude to Digicel for stepping in at the right moment. The little story of how this came about is also a sign that God does not sleep and he listens to our prayer. It was the Spirit of God that prompted Sister Claire Harris, Secretary of the Board, who regret regretfully is out of state to send a handwritten note, not by post, but by someone traveling to a very important person in Digicel. Um, to, to a very important a person in Digicel family, and today marks the product of this. He too, Mr. Dennis O'Brien, allowed God's spirit to touch his heart. Mr. O'Brien, we are deeply, Mr. O'Brien, we are deeply grateful. From, all, from now on, we have to count you as one of our benef benefactors, and you will always have a place in the prayer of the Clooney, Clooney Sisters and Our Lady of Guadalupe Home for Girls. Since today is such a red letter day, we would like to remember all those who have served the home over the past years, all the benefactors, including Ministry of Social Services. We also want to remember Mrs. Lavinia Gunn of the Musty Charitable Fund and Miss Jeannie Oliver of the Marion House, all well wishers, supporters in varying fields, past administrators, past house mothers, our watchmen, all have contributed in no small way with their time, talent, and treasure. We hope all girls who have been part of Our Lady of Guadalupe Home are better people for their stay and have touched, have been touched and healed in many ways. And we know the present girls at the home and the house mother, Miss Donnett Dowers, are very happy today. Digicel's country manager, John Gadari, received a directive from the big boss to help as soon as possible, and this was done to the best of his ability. We visited the home, we did quite a few things. Um, we met the board on countless occasions, but more importantly, we wanted to address a few things. We want to address safety, we wanted to address food safety as well, the safety of the girls, the dormitory, we looked at um, the plumbing issues that we had. We looked at a number of areas around um, electrical. And we looked at the general surroundings of the home. And generally, the experience the girls had when they actually come to the home or when they leave here. We listened to the house mothers. I think there are quite a few of them. And we worked very closely with them. But I have to say, you know, um, we couldn't have done this without Franco Construction, who came to the fore and did it from end to end with our guidance. So I have to say on Digicel's part, the way we look at things, we tend to give back, and not in a small way, but a big way, in the communities in which we serve. So it's one of the things that we live by, our chairman, his ideals, and what we believe in as a society, or for that matter, as a company. And we tend to actually do this very often throughout our existence, not just here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but throughout where we operate. We have looked at a number of areas in the home, and the chairman is now gonna receive one of our um, presentations showing what happened before and what happened after, taking him through a journey. But we had several partners in this process, we had um, also, I mentioned Franco Construction, but we had the government who actually helped us out with some waivers as well. Um, so we did a lot of work and we're now bringing it back to reality. Um, one of the main areas that we actually looked at was sustainability of the home. 
that was an area where we were very concerned. So we challenged the board of the home to make sure that we delivered not just a facility that's enhanced or refurbished, but rather we looked at how they can afford um, to take care of the girls moving forward. There's a bit of a gap, but we've come a long way and we've closed the gap by 75%. So we have another 25% to go. <laughs> On this project, Digicel has actually paid all utilities up to date as of yesterday. All utilities are up to date, whatever the backlog was. <laughs> as I mentioned before, we've narrowed the gap of um, the cost of the home on a monthly basis and we will share that with the board but we did a lot of work um, the local team um, while somebody was working on coordinating the project somebody's working on the sustainability part so we did a lot of work along those lines and we have a target as we do in Digicel we have a lot of targets but we've given ourselves a target for the next six months we expect to have this home fully sustainable Crystal Francis was the project manager the Our Lady of Guadalupe home is an essential part of our society and its existence has given many young women a secure place to call home. Because of this, its maintenance, upkeep and sustainability are therefore paramount to the lives of many and so cannot be ignored. On this note, as Mr. Gidhari already mentioned, I would like to thank the contractor, Franco Construction Limited, for carrying out works in such a complete and timely manner so that the day-to-day -day lives of all these residents could resume in a more comfortable and safe manner. Work commenced on the home on the 20th of June, and one of the first areas that required immediate attention was the refurbishment of the dormitory. Our aim here was to ensure that all residents were comfortable in their own personal space. We have ensured that every individual was given their own bed, new mattresses, new linens, and as well as their own private closet space. We have also replaced and repaired the restroom facilities assigned to the dorms. And these works have included the identification and repair of plumbing issues throughout the building. Our electrical scope included the repair and replacement of items such as lights, outlets, and general testing was carried out throughout the building to ensure the wiring was sound. The topic of safety was highlighted as a major concern. There were broken windows and doors which were all fully replaced. We have installed burglar bars on all windows in the dorms, and barbed wire fencing was placed on the perimeter walls to increase the security of the facility. Significant work was also carried out in the kitchen to improve the infrastructure and our concerns for food storage and safety were, remediated, were remedied by the purchase of a new deep freeze unit for bulk storage of food items. Aesthetically, the building also received a full facelift as the grounds were cleaned, roof drains and gutters were repaired and the entire home was painted both internally and externally. We have also outfitted the office with a new AC unit, filing cabinets and office furniture to ensure that the administrators of the home have full facilities to carry out their essential duties. Additionally, we have boosted the entertainment available for the residents by supplying a new, well, a brand new 50 inch screen television. The external works also included the grading of the yard erection of new clothing lines, and power washing of concrete surfaces to ensure that everything looked up to standard. The efforts put forward to making this project a success were tremendous. Free phone service is also among the list of donations made to the home. Digicel has also pledged its continued support to the home, which has delighted area representative Honorable Sinclair Jimmy Prince. The constituency of Maricopa has been at the forefront over the years of dealing with issues like this. We are the cradle, we like to think, of young people, challenged people. We have about four, we have, we have four um, primary schools in the area, three secondary schools, and now we host to the Guadalupe home. And we are very proud of that. And anybody who is going to help us to enhance that particular position, 
we're very grateful to you. Of course, you know, the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines has placed special emphasis on the vulnerable in the society, and we're thankful that Jesus has come on board. I'd like to thank the Catholics for what they have done um, in the initial stages, and um, I thank Sister Miguel, of course, for her initial um, intervention. You wouldn't know what she's done, but she, as a good Catholic and a former representative for this area, she has done a lot to ensure that the home for Guadalupe is what it is at this moment. I'd like to thank again Digicel, especially for your effort in the sustainability of the home. I know it is not just enough for you to just paint it and to leave, but you have put certain things in place, and I'm really astonished at the extent to which you have gone to help us. Thank you very much, Mr. Gitari, for that. I know the home has been doing good work. I know some of the residents have gone on to graduate from high school, and that, of course, is no mean feat. Um, I know you continue to do very well. The late Sister Pat will be remembered by many for her outstanding contribution, not only in the field of education, but also her work with social outreach programs. Minister of Social Development Honorable Frederick Stevenson also paid homage to the late nun, recognizing her input in coming to the rescue of teenage mothers. Out of those discussions that we had, Sister Pat as the principal here, at the St. Joseph's Convent, Marico, started taking in girls who got pregnant and, and were thrown out of school. She took them back, assisted them, helped them through, and many of them are very successful women today with good families. And we must remember Sister Pat for that. Now, the single parents program started by the Honorable Sister Girl in Miguel is one of the flagship programs in the Ministry of National Mobilization of which taken over from Sister Girl in and, and Brother Mike Brown I'm happy to say that we have had over 95% success rates in relation to what we've done with the Teen Mothers program in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We have not had many of them coming back and returning. Two years ago, there was a, a young lady from the Adelphi Secondary School who was a teen mother, who was a valedictorian. And she went on to university and is back now. A very proud product of our single parents program. And I could speak more about these things. The Guadalupe Home for Girls is another project that the Catholic Church started over nine years ago, I believe, nine, ten years ago, and uh, receives financial support in the form of a subvention from the Ministry of Social Development. Many of the young ladies or the young girls who come to the Guadalupe Home for Girls, most of them have been vetted by the Ministry of, of Social Development, the Gender Affairs Division, more importantly, that is the department that works very closely with the Guadalupe Home for Girls. And I can attest to the fact that this home has been providing for the young ladies who are here a wonderful opportunity for them to improve themselves and to make themselves better as we work with them so that they can go on to make meaningful contributions as citizens of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, making them better than when they came in. And uh, we have to, again, thank the Catholic Church for the tremendous work that they're doing in this particular area. Girls at the home are provided with counseling to help them get over the trauma. Because of its proximity to the St. Joseph's Convent, Maracua, a number of them attend that school. 
The age group of residents is between 12 to 18 years and they are housed there on a temporary basis based on the recommendation of the Ministry of Social Development. Kathy Rose reporting for the API. In case of an earthquake and the place that's shaking, shaking, drop, drop, cover, and hold on, drop, cover, and hold on. In case of an earthquake, there's a few tips that can keep you from harm. In case of an earthquake, you gotta stay calm, move away from doors, windows, and things that can fall. Try not to use steps or elevators at all. Drop, protect your head on your face, don't go running all over the place. Cover under a bed or a table, against a wall that's firm and stable. Hold on, you must hold on, don't panic, stay calm. Don't move until the shaking stops. Drop, drop, cover and hold on. Drop, cover and hold on in case of an earthquake. Drop, drop, cover and hold on. A message from the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, and the API. Learn how to protect yourself during an earthquake. Log on to weready.org. That's W-E-R-E-A-D-Y dot O-R-G for more information. In our final presentation, the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies are advancing a new initiative to develop community early warning systems worldwide. Fifteen Vincentians were chosen to take part in a training workshop held at the headquarters of the National Emergency Management Organization from July 18 to the 24th. Here's more from Shala John. The International Federation of the Red Cross, IFRC, and its local chapter have partnered with the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, in a new effort to develop community-based early warning systems in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The new initiative seeks to train trainers to effectively generate and disseminate timely and accurate warning information that will enable at-risk persons within vulnerable communities to prepare for and adequately respond to any impending threat or hazard. The week-long workshop saw participants from within the region engaging in a series of activities to enhance their ability to understand and interpret various meteorological and geological data. Technical officer with the International Federation of the Red Cross, Rendell Allen, outlined the objectives of the training, which is expected to significantly reduce the incidence of harm or loss during times of disasters. The International Federation of the Red Cross, in collaboration with the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Red Cross and the National Emergency Management Organization, NEMO, um, we're implementing a, a toolkit that was developed by the, the International Federation that is geared to working along with vulnerable communities in identifying um, suitable um, early warning system. Uh, but this is a part of a regional program that the International Federation is hosting in the region. And this, we are working in, in Suriname, Grenada, and Jamaica, as well as St. Vincent. Now, this component of the training is in collaboration also with the French Red Cross, who's working at the community level. So a lot more activities are geared towards the community here in St. Vincent. Uh, the methodology, um, we have 15 associate trainers um, who represent um, the Red Cross, NEMO, and also from some of our participating national societies. So this week we also have uh, Belize, Antigua, and Grenada participating in the training here in St. Vincent. Now we're hoping that uh, these associate trainers would be a part of a a global roster of trainers who would be eligible to be deployed in different regions or different countries to roll out similar trainings um, as the need may be. The St. Vincent and the Grenadines Red Cross over the past year or so has been working in six uh, communities throughout St. Vincent. One of the activities that they're doing is a vulnerability and capacity assessment. Now this methodology is where they look at the uh, the hazards and the different vulnerabilities that exist within their communities. Also, they identify the capacities that they have within their own community that would be a resource 
to them when there's an emergency. So the Red Cross, as well as NEMO, has been working along with six communities um, as part of this project uh, to identify the risks, the hazards, and what capacities they have. Now, as part of the community early warning systems training, um, we're using that same baseline data that was collected by the community to now identify suitable uh, low-cost um, early warning systems. Um, the community have a lot of information. They've been developing their own informal early warning systems. So the idea now is to link that more seamlessly to the national early warning system that exists here in St. Vincent. When it comes to the selection of the community participant, we try to target a wide cross-section of persons. So we, we, we try to find the influential persons within the community um, because these are the persons who the other members often look to uh, to lead and to guide um, the different activities or um, to really support them when, when something happens. So we want to ensure that we target these persons. Of course we we look at different profiles, so we want to have like the teachers, uh, uh, the church leaders, but also the young people, because oftentimes, you know, there are different perspectives, uh, there are different approaches that would need to be taken uh, to reach everyone in the community. So, so we have a, a profile that, that we, we use to um, target these different persons. Consultant for the IFRC and workshop facilitator, Leslie Mornier, expounded on the workshop's goals. This training is really about bringing science to society. We, it's based on a methodology that we've tested and tried and perfected in West Africa, in three countries in the English-speaking part of West Africa. And the idea is to bring science to society, to bring high-tech to low-tech, to, to find appropriate ways that communities can interact with science because science sometimes is hard to understand and we really want to have the Red Cross is in a good position to bridge science and communities and so there's a great information in most of these countries and St. Vincent there's a wonderful MET service um, and they deliver a lot of very interesting information but sometimes it's not interpreted at the at the right level sometimes it's misunderstood sometimes it doesn't reach people and so the idea is how to um, get the communities to understand how they can interpret those messages and how they can react accordingly and save lives in, 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 spite, in spite of the timeliness of those messages. And if we can get a good set of trainers out of this training session, then those trainers can go on to other countries and repeat the same process. In most countries, they have a stronger national uh, med service, a national early warning service, stronger every day. But it's still often not reaching the communities that need it most. So it's really making the bridge between the two. Deputy Director of NEMO, Michelle Forbes, outlined the role of her organization in this new effort. Forbes also gave background information on this project, which will give support to the already established National Early Warning System. The involvement of the National Emergency Management Organization with the SVG Red Cross um, went back to several projects that the Red Cross have been implementing in St. Vincent and the Grenadines on the DPECO project. Following the December 2013 floods, we were approached by the United Nations Development Program for Barbados and the OECS, that's UNDP, and the local Red Cross in terms of identifying the communities who would have been at risk to flooding over a period of time. Hence, there were six communities that were that were selected for the component of this project. We have Georgetown, Georgetown is quite large, so we have Georgetown North and Georgetown South, South Rivers, Vermont, Mesopotamia, I think that's the six, right? So those are the six communities that were, that were selected. And based on that, the National Emergency Management Organization would have also worked with UNDP, the Red Cross, on identifying two of the key communities that we wanted some kind of intervention in terms of supporting the National Early Warning System Network. Now, the UNDP has already worked with the CWSA, and we are now having some other discussions with other agencies in terms of having a component of an early warning system, which is the rain gauge and stream flow data, stream flow um, equipment that will be installed at Vermont 
and at South Rivers. Now, those were lost during the December 2013 floods from CWSA. So, they are, so the UNDP and the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology have been partnering with the Red Cross, with NEMO and UNDP to re basically like replace those equipment. So that will feed into the national early warning system and eventually the community early warning system. Now, the community program is really focused on mobilizing the community. So as, as they're always the first line of defense and response following uh, the impact of a hazard and hence as, a, as an organization that supports um, disaster risk reduction at a national level and down to the community level we are partnering with the Red Cross be because we also need these partners to feed into the entire national system in terms of the project. Now this week is a, it's a seven day program we go from Monday to Sunday each every day and we have the first component deals with the associate three day, first two days is with the associate trainers and we have 15 associate trainers 10 from the red cross and nemo was selected five our five persons also work along with the red cross um, from nemo point of view and also three from nemo and two strong members from the community who are also work, working along with the red cross and the forestry department and another person is from the community development division so hence we see the community plus the science plus the other agencies need to be involved now, so the first two days is really with the associate trainers. The next three days until Saturday is working with the community members. So today, from today, we have persons from all the six communities I, I mentioned here joining us with the associate trainers where we'll pair off and ensure that whatever is... Um, presented during the week that they understand what is happening. So as associate trainers, we will work along with those persons from the community so they understand the concepts, the methodology, because for the community to, to determine what kind of early warning system they need, they need to understand what is a hazard, what are disasters, and what can they use a simplified form in their community that will alert the members in the community of what is happening in the event of an emergency. It doesn't have to be um, natural hazard only. They can decide another another um, hazard, for example, burglar, burglary, you know, other event um, that can happen in the community. They can use a, that kind of early warning system. So it has to be localized. We can bring all the technology. We can bring whatever we want. But at the end of the day, it is what the community decide based on what we um, present this week and discuss this week and when they go back to the community and we're actually visiting the community on Saturday to determine what they see fits best for their community and they're able to interpret because it does not make sense bringing satellite imagery and all these high-tech equipment and no one at the community to interpret it and actually to disseminate that information. And this is continuing on the National Early Warning System um, that NEMO started with the United Nations Development Program in 2014 in terms of looking at different ways of getting the information down to the community. So we have been deploying what we call the radio data systems for different communities on the Red Cross project that would have started with volcanic hazard in 2014 and now we're on to the flood hazard. Distributing these equipment so that we at the national level could can at least send an alert to the members of the community and then they in turn alert the communities. So it's a process. It's not a, it's not a, a one-off thing. It's a continued process, a continued working with the communities, working with the national entities to ensure that we build and strengthen our national emergency warning system because it's not perfect. We have some semblance of the system. We have the Met Office, for example, that disseminates all the weather information and we want to build on what we have existing so that the people who need that warning most, the persons at the community level, can actually get it and actually um, respond and save lives. There are plans for the simulation exercise in 2017. We are working with the SVG Red Cross, um, IFRC, and the French Red Cross um, to look for continuation and sustaining the project in that the next phase will, of course, have to be a, a testing of a, whatever existing system the community chooses to implement and also the national system. How does it filter down to the community level? Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I'm Sharish John. And on this note, we thank you so much for viewing our presentation this evening from the Agency for Public Information. We invite you to join us again on Thursday evening at 8 for another presentation. On behalf of the entire production team, has wishing you a wonderful evening and a fabulous work week. Good evening.